So welcome to all of you that are joining us now, whether you're joining us here live or viewing this later on the recording, we are so happy to have you with us. My name is Naomi Hoffer. I'm the program manager for the UCSF Sherry Sobrato Brisson Brain Cancer Survivorship Program. And also here in the Zoom background is Alexa Greenstein, who is our survivorship nurse practitioner, and Mary Destry, who is our Marin Expansion Program Liaison. And you'll be hearing from Mary, perhaps seeing her in the chat box, as well as we'll be bringing on Alexa at the end to join us for the Q&A period to help us answer some of your questions. So again, glad to have you here. This webinar is a part of our monthly Living Well After Brain Cancer Treatment webinar series, which is a segment of our growing survivorship program that we've launched at the UCSF Neural Oncology Department, thanks to a generous donation from Sherry Sobrato Brisson. Other components of our survivorship program include a neurocognitive consultation clinic, integrative therapy classes, a peer support program and Thrivers community, and an exercise counseling service. So we're really excited today about the topic of psilocybin, and we're going to discuss together what we know and don't yet know about its potential effects, especially for brain cancer survivors. Because psilocybin is currently a controlled substance in most parts of the country, we want to make it really clear to everyone watching that we are in no way recommending or even suggesting its use. And regardless of its legal status, there is still so much that we don't yet understand about it, and um, experiences can really differ among users. So we want you to know that the opinions and views expressed in today's webinar are not necessarily those of UCSF, but not intended to provide legal interpretation or be a statement of UCSF practice or policy. So that being said, we know that this is a topic of growing interest, especially as we see more research coming out with respect to the effects of psilocybin on alleviating anxiety and depression in cancer patients. Just as cannabis has become recently legalized in several states, many people are expecting the same to be true for psychedelics in the near future. So we felt it was really important for us to at least offer you some basics on what psilocybin is, how it works, what effects are being reported anecdotally and um, in the media and in research settings, and what the gaps are in our current knowledge. So first, we will hear from our featured expert on what psilocybin is and how it functions in the body. We'll, we'll hear about experiences of users, both anecdotally as well as what's been published in the research and other literature. We will also discuss where it stands in terms of legal status. As I mentioned earlier, it's currently not legalized in most places, but there are efforts underway in some states to change this, and we'll hear more about that. Then we'll have the good fortune of hearing directly from one brain tumor survivor who will share with us what his experience has been. And we hope to have time for questions at the end. You can submit your questions using the Q&A box in your, on your Zoom screen. We invite you also to join us afterwards in our after the show unrecorded segment, and we can hear directly from you uh, to continue the conversation. So now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our first featured speaker for today's webinar. Dr. David Bullard is a licensed psychologist and licensed marriage and family therapist in private practice who has been providing psychotherapy to individuals and couples for over 30 years. He has served as clinical professor of psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Weill Institute of Neuroscientists, where he continues to contribute in a volunteer capacity. He has hosted symposia, taught courses to medical students, nurses, interns, residents, faculty, therapists, and other healthcare providers, and led presentations on such topics as coping with trauma using non-traditional or ancient medicinal modalities. He also provides mentoring for students at the Center for Psychedelic Therapies and Research at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco. He continues to be involved on the cutting edge in therapeutic interventions and he helps weave together ancient wisdom with conventional modalities in his lovely, creative, and gentle way, as you will see. Dr. Bullard, thank you so much for being here with us today. I am now going to turn it back over to you, and I will jump in again in about 35 minutes. Thank you. And welcome to all of us for this presentation. It's going to be a very special one because <clears throat> we are talking about things that haven't been quite explicitly addressed yet, which is brain cancer and psilocybin. I am not an expert, and I don't, I'm not sure I believe in experts, because as my Tibetan Buddhist friends say, all learning is group learning. 
And anything I say today that might be helpful to you probably came from the people who've been helpful to me. And if I say anything in error or just am plain wrong about, that's my fault. But the good stuff will be coming from people like Bill Richards, who I was able to interview when his book came out. I'll show you that. I recommend it. It's sacred knowledge. Dr. Richards is at Johns Hopkins University, and he and Mary Cosimano were the two people very instrumental with Dr. Roland Griffiths in doing the research that we'll be talking about later. And he's been a friend, and Mary has been a friend. And I met Janice Phelps, who four years ago started the California Institute for Integral Studies program for the first time training people who are therapists and other healthcare providers to be able to sit and be with people who are going through the psychedelic experience, usually with psilocybin. And even though it isn't legal yet and wasn't legal then for sure, there's going to be a big need. And their program has just this year expanded to 200 people that they're training per year. It's a very intense program. I've also been involved in trauma therapy and I think of cancer as a trauma. I myself have not had cancer. I don't have it that I know of, although I think many of us, our bodies are fighting off cancer cells all the time. But I, I do relate to people who've had medical procedures. When I was three years old, I had an appendectomy at a time when they use ether, which is a suffocation experience. And then I had four more operations before I was 11. I spent a lot of time in hospitals as a result of that, not as much as many other people have, but ended up with my being interested in medical care and helping. So that's part of my journey, why I'm here. In Ann Arbor, Michigan in 1967, I actually took a psychedelic for the first time after hearing Timothy Leary come and speak to our group. <clears throat> and I was a young man, I was about 22 years old. And I had this experience of trying to think of, well, who am I really? Who am I? And my identity, was I a college student graduate? That didn't seem to really be the deepest part of who I was. Was I from a suburb of Detroit? That label didn't seem to really be who I was. And I kept going through different aspects, taking off ideas of who I was as if I was taking off pieces of clothing. I, I even took off the fact that I was a male. That didn't seem to be the essence of it. And it got down to a feeling of just probably being light or energy. I tried to talk about this experience the next day in a graduate seminar in literature and um, people listened to me and then changed the subject. So I'm glad I get to talk about it again with, with all of you because our hope is not just, we certainly hope that psilocybin and those kinds of medicines as we'll hear about will be helpful to many more people going forward. But it isn't just the medicine, it's the experience that people have under safe conditions, being with a couple of very trained, caring people. So it makes it safe in contrast to the, the reason they outlawed it. One of the reasons in 1970, all of these drugs and made them schedule one was there were reports of uh, bad reports of people having bad trips and doing bad things that is minimized absolutely when we can do these medicines under the supervision as we'll be talking about. I think next I want to um, just mention, uh, think for a moment, we're really not learning just about a medicine, but what does the medicine give people? What do they take away from it? 
what sustains them? And recently we had a five-year follow-up to the 2016 study. We're hoping that today's webinar will give you some tools to take with you even without taking psilocybin. Many of you have been exploring through meditation and spirituality and religion, your own way of looking at what are the big, what are the answers to the big questions of life and death or are there only big questions? So I'm going to start a, a little bit of a PowerPoint thing. Okay, we know, what is that? We all know what that is. Isn't it a miracle? I'd like to talk in these next slides just for a moment about how magic it is that we're even breathing in and breathing out and that we're on this. Do you know the latest count of how many stars there are in the universe? 70 billion trillion. And we've only got one star, our sun, and we're here. How about in your head, your brain cells? They used to think it was quite a bit, a trillion brain cells and a hundred billion neurons, but they've, they've, uh, they said, we don't have that money. We're just down to that 8.6 times 10 to the 10th. That's still, we have a lot of brain cells, but you know what? Well, those are big numbers. There's only one you in all of this universe, something to be celebrated. I'm celebrating today because a friend of mine, who a woman who started a trauma therapy called EMDR, Francine Shapiro, died on this day two years ago. And yesterday was my father's birthday, although he died in 1978. All these people that we've known and loved, but there's only one you. And a lot of what I think psychotherapy is, or a lot of what life is about, is learning to love yourself. But life has suffering. This is one of my favorite quotes from Thich Nhat Hanh. Suffering is not enough. Life is both dreadful and wonderful. How can I smile when I'm filled with so much sorrow? It is natural. You need to smile to your sorrow because you are more than your sorrow. I know many of you have been struggling either because of your own cancer and treatment or your loved one's cancer and treatment or your patient's cancer and treatment or someone you know who's a friend. I've had several friends with brain cancer and I know that it's a, it can be a very hard road at times. But I'd like to share with you a story from the Dalai Lama that I heard he said to a journalist in 1984, he was telling her with deep sadness in his eyes about what had happened to his country and the loss of temples and imprisonment and death because of what had happened to Tibet. And it's such a depth of pain and sadness and compassion. And then she said, he looked out the window at a tree and when he looked back, he was filled, his eyes looked like filled with bliss. And he said, life is so very colorful, isn't it? And that's my favorite story about him because it helps us understand we can go into the depths of very sad times and come out of it into mindfulness and into the present moment. Okay. Psilocybin, that's what you came here to talk about. I'm not an expert. I'm not gonna tell you the chemical composition of psilocin, that is the main thing that interacts with the serotonin receptors in your brain, but it's ancient. Good records going back 6,000 years that it was used in religious rituals. More information about the historical part So the effects on consciousness, because that's what we're here to talk about, can be euphoria, other what they call hallucinations. You'll hear later from somebody who's experienced it and will talk with you about his experience. Changes in perception, altered sense of time. Wait till you hear what some of the people say about that. 
about time sort of losing its meaning. My Tibetan friends taught me also that time is not linear and they have a way of understanding consciousness that means that the past is present, the present is present, and the future is present, and it's all part of one big canopy of life and of consciousness. I can't pretend to understand all that, but I like to just mention it. Spiritual experiences abound from, as you'll see from the research that we'll get into. However, there are adverse effects of nausea and moments of anxiety or panic. But when under the controlled condition of what's called psychedelic assisted therapies, there are people there to hold your hand, people there to encourage you to let go, to confront rather than run away from what seems to be scary to you. Bill Richard says, you may have an image of a tiger that wants to leap on you, but if you stay with it, that may turn out to be someone entirely different. And you can go from a moment of fear to a moment of deep relaxation and even joy and delight. Last year, we had this presentation. Brian Murarescu has a wonderful book called The Immortality Key, The Secret History of Religion with No Name. And his 10 years of research found evidence for psychedelic use in 2000 years of ancient Greece. And you'd have to, won't go into it, but it's very interesting. And in early Christianity until about 350 AD that people actually would go and have this psychedelic experience and find a way to achieve immortality, which is just another way of saying that they didn't fear death. This is his book. This is a great quote. And the, the point is that if your ego can let go, you will then find a way to feel part of everything. This is the book by Rich, William Richards I highly recommend. He has two master's degrees in theology, a PhD in psychology, and he first experienced psilocybin in 1963 in Germany, and he's been involved in psychedelic research ever since. This is a lovely book for those of you who are interested in more reading about the history of sacred knowledge from these psychedelic plants and fungi. This is the most popular book that came out uh, about two years ago, maybe three years ago. Michael Pollan has been a big contributor to our understanding. It can be a beautiful experience. This is a way to look at what happens in the research and in the way that you do it if you're under the, the help of some guides. You have to feel safe. And so you meet a few times with the guides who've been trained. Then you have your awarenesses during the session and the guide will take notes and talk with you later for what's called integration. And that's maybe one of the more important parts of it, how to integrate what you learned into your life. 80% of the people at Johns Hopkins, which includes similar results from New York University with Tony Bosis and other people and UCLA with Charlie Grob and other people. Significant decrease. And even though 67% said it was one of the top five meaningful experiences, something like 35% said it was the most meaningful experience of their life. These are themes that emerge. I won't read them all. I like decreases in petty concerns and holding on to grudges. Aren't we all working at things like that? You don't have to take psilocybin, but it really helped people with this. Increase in patience. Other themes. We are love, we're all connected. 
we've heard these terms before. It could sound trite, but when you're able to experience it in the way they do with these medicines, it's quite profound. Feeling the interconnectedness to all of life. I once had a sense of that my, my two adult children tell me they enjoy um, my excitement about certain things. Then I realized, well, even after I'm gone, they will be experiencing excitement. So somehow something lives on in consciousness. This is one of the volunteers. It's a total connection with the universe. It's a state of awareness that's beyond description, profound, yet one has a deeply knowingness that is our true reality. You're gonna hear directly from one of their participants in just about one minute. Death doesn't matter. There's this constant state of becoming. I felt gratitude. Something else I experienced was the feeling that time is eternal. And that's also what the Tibetan Buddhists have told her to tell me. No fear of recurrence of cancer it does not enter my mind because that person is living so much in the present moment. And the overall, the Beatles, all you need is love and everything is love. We know that it's not legal, but California last week passed through the Senate a bill that would make decriminalization for these kinds of medicines. The research has really demonstrated the therapeutic benefits. This is from the New York Academy of Sciences just a couple of weeks ago. This has been a real revolution in psychiatry. But we also need to know these options for healing work that can help to bring people to the same place. You will be looking up information if you're interested in holotropic breath work developed by Stan Groff. And it's a way of breathing with someone trained in this work where you build up your oxygen levels and have as close to a psychedelic experience as possible. We know for a fact, and you'll hear again from our uh, person who will be talking with you directly, mindful meditation helped him a lot, acupuncture. Flash technique is a trauma therapy that is a new thing that 8,000 trauma therapists have been trained into. Ketamine assisted psychotherapy can be helpful to many people and that's legal. We know that support groups help, just helps to feel connected to others and any therapeutic relationships that you have. These are just some studies. I'm not going to really have you uh, go through them at all. These are organizations that have sprung up just recently. One at UCSF in the Neuroscape and one at the, uh, the two actually at UCSF now. The Band Lab has been there for several years under Josh Woolley. We have a group called the Psychedelic and Entheogen Academic Council that meets weekly. Berkeley has a fairly new center for the science of psychedelics and then the California Institute of Integral Studies places. We don't need to go into this now, what's a trauma memory, but a lot of what we experience is uh, reflected in the comment by, I believe it was Mark Twain, who's saying most of the horrible things in his life never really happened. Or uh, we could add to it, it's not happening right now. A lot of what bothers us is regret about the past or traumas with dealing with procedures or learning about a diagnosis of cancer. We're gonna have a, make time for sure for questions and answers. Uh, the research that's been done, they have specifically excluded brain cancer. So we don't have phase two safety trials yet, but I'm hoping that this is a start of informational material that will get out there that will get some researchers interested because there are brain cancer patients who've done psilocybin and have benefited from it. And I think it is really a worthy thing to explore. 
Naomi, is it time to have uh, Eric join us? Yeah. yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Bullard. Um, I really appreciate all that you covered and I know there's so much more and, and I, I wanna remind everybody to please type in questions that you have in the Q&A and we'll have some time at the end. We'll bring um, Dr. Bullard back on. And what I'd like to do now is just uh, show you a, a conversation that we had with one of our wonderful survivors. Um, his name is Eric. And I think we're gonna play a recorded video that we had uh, recorded earlier this week. Thank you, Eric, so much for being with us here today to help us understand this topic a little bit more from a personal perspective of someone who is living with brain cancer. So if you could please just start us out by telling us a little bit about yourself, your background before your diagnosis, and just what, what brought you to using psilocybin? Yeah, yeah. So I'm 46 years old. I'm married. Uh, I have two daughters. Um, I'm a small business owner. Um, I've done some real estate development. Um, I served four years in the Marine Corps where I spent time in the Persian Gulf and, and throughout the West Pacific. Um, I have experienced a bit of trauma throughout my life. Um, I was bullied as a kid. Um, I was often malnourished. Uh, my sister and I were raised by a single teenage mother with no extended family, grew up on welfare. Um, slept in a car in a parking lot where my mom waited tables at night as a cocktail waitress. And the bouncers used to check on us when my sister and I were like four and five years old. Um, my father, thankfully, was absent most of my life. Um, my parents divorced when I was two. Uh, he was the worst type of father. He was abusive. He beat my mother. He was a drug dealer and a criminal. He spent 16 years in prison. Um, in 2013, the trauma continued. My daughter uh, was having some problems breathing. We thought it was asthma. Uh, we took her to the doctor and they ordered some imaging and discovered a mediastinal mass in her chest. Um, she, she actually stopped breathing. Um, the mediastinal mass had collapsed her airway. Um, my wife was in the room when it happened. I was not. But um, when I got there, I came into a room with between eight and 10 white coats surrounding her to get her breathing again. Um, she spent uh, four days in a coma in the ICU. Um, after uh, two and a half years of cancer treatment where she almost died a couple of times, um, she completed her treatment and was doing absolutely amazing. And then three weeks later, I started having seizures <laughs> and uh, I ignored them wow. at first and then um, went and got some imaging done on my brain and they, it's when they saw a something. Uh, followed with a, a biopsy uh, where they discovered a, a GBM in my head. Uh, that was five years ago. Um, mm. So I, I did some Googling and discovered that most people with the GBM, you know, survive for 12 mm. to 15 months and they're not pleasant. And I'm, I'm at five and a half years at this point. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I've done... Um, I've done two brain surgeries um, and then a bunch of other things. So you had a lot of trauma before your brain cancer diagnosis even. And yeah. yeah. so how did you come in contact with psilocybin? How did you even decide that it was something you would like to experiment with or try? So, um, I had tried, I had had, I was having some severe depression. And, um, and I tried talk therapy and, um, and that didn't, didn't really get me the results I was looking for. Um, I tried, uh, I was on antidepressants, um, those stopped working. Um, I, um, did some, uh, EMDR therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, I found uh, a therapist who I did about 
uh, four months of EMDR therapy with that therapist and it helped, it helped, but it didn't, it still, there were still these torments that were bothering me that I couldn't, I couldn't get past. And it was just, it was still more and more depression. Yeah. Um, so I started uh, doing some research and I discovered some of the uh, successes people were having with microdosing psilocybin. So I started off uh, with a microdose every three days. Actually, I read Michael Pollan's book, Change Your Mind. Mm. And kind of followed his regimen of what he had done. And, and um, so I started by microdosing every three days. Um, and then uh, one day, my mic- I actually took a little bit bigger of a microdose, and would, which would I guess would be called a dose. And, uh, and I started to experience things a little differently from that point forward. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, there wasn't like a doctor who could just, just take me on, or, you know, on this, give me a, a prescription of what to do. It just doesn't exist. You have to kind of navigate your world through the web and other people and talking to other people about their experiences to try and find a way to, to, um, to use this product. You know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not legalized yet. Okay. So could you tell us a little bit about what you experienced during its use? What happened? What were the effects? Yeah. <laughs> I started smiling more. Um, <laughs> all of a sudden one day I just woke up and, um, I realized I was smiling a lot more. Uh, the things that were tormenting me weren't tormenting me as much. Um, it, it's almost like if, if you were in a very deep, like foggy, you know, place, and then all of a sudden the fog started to burn off and you had glimpses of the blue sky again. Mm. And so you noticed those effects after you took the dosage or during, did you notice, did you notice anything during you were saying afterwards? Yeah, it wasn't, it, I wasn't, when I was microdosing, you don't, I didn't feel anything, you know, it wasn't like, like I didn't feel it at all. It just, it's just after six months of microdosing um, and, and, and taking a, you know, a little bit more than a microdose on accident um, that I just like, Oh, wow. That, that is just a little brighter. And I just started to notice things more. Like, wow, I started to wake up. So when you were microdosing, how often did you administer it? And how did you administer it? Yeah, so um, I, I started asking around to some friends about where I could find some mushrooms. Mm-hmm. And uh, a buddy of mine said that he had uh, some a friend of his that had access to some mushrooms. And so I said, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love them. So I, I picked up some mushrooms and I started just by taking just a little stem or a little cap and I would just eat it in the morning uh, every third, every third day. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then um, I ended up working up. My goal was to get to a, a five gram heroic dose mm-hmm. uh, and a buddy of mine had had some experience with psychedelics. And so I asked him if he would join me uh, in, in, in pushing to that five gram dose. Okay. And so when you did do that five gram dose, what was the effects? Did you notice anything different in your cognition or what, how did it affect you? During the five gram dose, um, it was, uh, I didn't notice anything right there. I mean, I had, I had the full psychedelic experience and the visuals and uh, the, um, the emotions that just came out of me. It was from hysterical laughter to hysterical crying, to back to hysterical laughter, to crawling around on the floor, <laughs> to, you know, peeking outside. Um, it, was, it was a very controlled set and setting um so that i could have the best chances of of a of a beneficial experience i planned for it i i didn't just jump in there and take five grams of mushrooms no i had to plan 
you know, mentally and, and physically and my, and environmentally about how I was going to, going to do this. Mm. And how did you set up that experience for yourself? So I, um, I was in my, uh, in, in my room, um, with the complete, the shades completely drawn, um, uh, you know, in a completely safe space, I had, uh, uh, headphones, um, and I had eye shades and a weighted blanket and, um, oh, and that mm-hmm. was, mm-hmm. The, you know, a really comfortable, you know, safe space that I felt. Okay. So it sounds like part of the setup was making sure there was no other distractions, making sure it was quiet, that you could just be in your own space. Yeah. Yeah. Do not disturb sign on the door. (laughs) (laughs) For me, it's a little scary. The thought that somebody could walk into a store without a prescription and just grab this and and do it. Because I think if it's done in the wrong environment, it, it could actually do harm to somebody. Mm. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, we hope that it's only positive benefits for those with brain cancer, but we just don't know. I don't think there's been any research done uh, using psilocybin with those who have brain cancer. So um, until, you know, we get some research on that, we just, we just don't know. Well, it's my experience or it's my understanding that, that, um, that trauma Um, it can, it can really help with trauma. So like I have had trauma as a child and I, I, uh, which, which was, which was a a emotional trauma. And then I had, um, some physical trauma, uh, to my brain when, uh, from the tumor and then the doctors went in there and poked around and that's more trauma to the brain. And then they, they radiated radiation directly to the brain is more trauma to the brain. And so what I thought, what I, you know, understood in my brain was that the neural pathways were getting shut down as a result of that trauma. And so I was looking for ways to open up uh, the neural pathways. And that's where I came, started coming across the idea of psilocybin. Um, Since then, I, I, I've, I feel like the neural pathways uh, have opened up to allow me to process the trauma and uh, um, also with the help of therapists uh, to, to have a, a life that I feel is worth living. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, that's so good to hear. And so is there anything else that you want to share with others who might be considering this? Don't just jump in. Um, I know, like, I was desperate but I just didn't jump in the pool. I, I dipped a toe in and checked the water temperature. And then I waded in slowly. And uh, that seemed to work really well for me, you know, to just, to just wade into it rather than jump full into it. You know, I wouldn't recommend a five gram dose to just anybody, yeah. you know, right. yeah, I, I, you have to have an intention or I, I feel like I needed to have an intention I still use um, psilocybin regularly in a microdose level Mm -hmm. to um, help with clarity. Mm. So do you find that it is um, helpful for clarity for you? Um, I do. I do. Uh, Not necessarily when I'm, when I'm actually like the, like if when I'm taking it, but in the days following, um, you know, things just seem a little lighter. You know, mm-hmm. the, um, the things are just a little brighter. It's almost like the world is in high definition. It's, mm-hmm. the, it's almost like the way that I want to see the world, you know, yeah. like bright and clear. And um, yeah. And yes. then when when something challenging comes up, I'm better prepared to deal with it rather than just, you know, just um, isolate, which is what yeah. I was doing. Yes. Wonderful. Well, that's so good to hear. Um, and I guess I didn't ask, do, have you noticed any adverse effects from its use? Occasionally, um, I get a little bit of anxiety. So um, they're not, the doses aren't measured. 
completely. You know, I don't know how much psilocybin I'm actually getting, you know? Um, And so sometimes I'll just take a little stem or a cap of a mushroom and it's a little bit more than a microdose. And then all of a sudden um, I'll find myself in a weird kind of in-between space and that's Mm -hmm. uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And then I, if I recognize that, um, then I can do a meditation um, and, and, and help Mm -hmm. to, to calm me back down. So it can have that adverse effect. Oh, that's um, I, I, I do want to say though. Um, so I've done in, in trying to rewire my brain. Um, I, I did the, the, the micro dosing of the psilocybin, the most, the, but the most beneficial thing that I've done is um, a practice that I've incorporated in my life is meditation. Mm. Um, mindful mindfulness meditation, I think, has um, if I had out of all the things I've done, if I had to point my finger at the one thing that was the most beneficial, I would say it was the mindfulness meditation, and then the second would be would be, be the microdosing of the psilocybin. Oh, that's so interesting. I think they kind of go hand in hand together, though, too. Can you say a little bit more about that? How meditation and psilocybin go hand in hand? The meditation helps to clear a lot of the thoughts and that the, the control uncontrollable racing thoughts to make a pathway for the psilocybin to have its best uh, mm. benefits. Yeah. Yeah. That's so that makes sense. Yeah, that does. Yeah. Um, and, and so just to go back to recommending recommended uh, set and setting for, for others who are considering this, does it help to have an intention to before you go into an experience like this to have something of intention that you're going to be working on or thinking of? Absolutely. Yeah. I re- I've written down my intentions before. Not, I mean, I haven't had the intent, like written down the intentions for the microdosing because I was doing it every third day for like 18 months. So, okay. but for the bigger doses, I absolutely wrote down an intention, what I was trying to achieve. Like, like for me, the big one was the torments the things that were tormenting me and I would write those down and how to, how to, how, how to create a way for those torments to not be as debilitating. Mm. Wow. Great. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for being so candid and open about your experience using psilocybin and other therapies you've used and your history and background. Um, and I know that we are going to have some time for people to ask you questions for those listening. Sure. But, uh, thank you again for your time and helping us understand this topic. Eric. Yeah, thank you. Well, great. Thank you, Alexa, for sharing that video. Um, so I'd love to invite you to ask questions now. Eric, I, I would love to invite you on uh, voice only. And uh, Dr. Bullard's here. Uh, Alexa, if you want to join us as well, we'd, we'd love to you know, try to answer uh, your questions. And we understand that there might be more questions than there are answers at this point, but that's okay. That's how we all learn. So um, there are some questions coming in. And uh, uh, the first one that came in that, Alexa was about the issue of do we know anything about brain tumor growth with the use of psilocybin or other psychedelics? And as a non physician, I can't answer that except that I don't think we have the data. And aren't people given SSRIs, which even with brain tumors, that also impact serotonin receptors? So I would highly doubt that it would promote tumor growth. But do we have the data on that? That's a really great question. Um, and I know that's a lot of um, people's minds right now. Um, and the unfortunate reality is that we just don't know yet. A lot of the current studies on psilocybin have been in other cancer populations. So we don't have enough research. We don't have any research right now to make any sort of conclusion. So we're definitely thinking about that. Um, but right now, we just don't have any, any evidence. Yeah. As of a few days ago, I checked with a friend at the National Cancer Institute who's aware of all the research going on. He said there were zero clinical trials involving psilocybin and brain cancer people. 
So we need to get somebody interested in that. Yeah, need some research, don't we? Yes. Um, so here's another question. Um, how can I access psilocybin assisted therapy? In a clinical trial is the only way to do that uh, legally. And we'll have some references for you that you'll get sent next week. There are, is a phase three, couple of phase three clinical trials oh. here. There are some on the East Coast, there's several going on across the country, but there are a couple in particular that were recommended by Bill Richards. And Bill oh. is the one, the senior guy, he's been doing this since 1963, who's at Johns Hopkins. I wanted to write one other thing, uh, speak that he'd written to me this morning because I had inquired about the issue that used to be called compassionate use and now it's called expanded access in the United States for medications or clinical trials of drugs that maybe uh, you don't qualify for. Sometimes an individual can petition to get included and guess who's ahead of us on this? Canada. So Bill wrote, several expanded access authorizations with cancer patients have occurred in Canada. A young physician in Marathon, Ontario by the name of Ryan has treated one person thus far in this arrangement and we can email him and there's uh, other people's available with a, with a video. So Canada is leading the way in allowing this to happen. There's so many things happening legislatively with just last week at passing the California Senate. Scott Weiner spoke at our Psychedelic and Entheogen Academic Council last Friday. So we're hoping things will move along quicker. But even before you can get into a clinical trial, there may be a possibility of a kind of expanded access. And then I wanna bring it back again to the idea that it isn't, maybe the, the drug really helps people get to this state of consciousness, but there are other ways for thousands, tens of thousands of years that people have tried to get to similar places, places of peace. And those were listed and you'll get that list again too. Holotropic breath work, I would encourage you to try. Ketamine assisted psychotherapy had some excellent results and that is legal. And a colleague and friend who's in Marin, Phil Wolfson is one of the pioneers in the use of ketamine. He has something called the Ketamine Research Foundation. And it's again, a hallucinatory experience, but that people feel very good about afterwards. So all of this will be in the detailed in the information you get later. Great, thank you. Um, here's another question around, um, this might be for you, Alexa. I have heard that by increasing neural pathways, it might promote brain cancer spread. Is that true? Another really great question. And, and I'm afraid I don't have a real answer uh, at this point. We just don't know. There's just very limited evidence and research in brain tumor populations. So yeah. at this point, I don't have any answers. Okay. And I, Okay, great. And there's another one I'm just going to, it also might be, we don't know yet, but I'm going to ask you anyway, can I use psilocybin while on chemotherapy? That's another wonderful question. And I think that we can't make any assumptions yet of how this substance will interact with other medications such as SSRIs or chemotherapy for that matter. But I know in other cancer populations, they are studying this and so we can learn from that, but of course we can't make any assumptions that the safety profile for a patient of another cancer would be the same for someone who has brain tumor, brain cancer. So we just need more research and more evidence to make more of a conclusion and more informed decision. Okay, great, thank you. And here's a question I, I think for Eric, if you could answer um, verbally. Uh, did psilocybin change your outlook on living with brain cancer? Um, it, it helped with the depression. And yes, I, I would say it did. It, it, it made me feel, 
bigger than just myself. Like I'm, I'm part of something bigger. I'm part of this universe. I'm, it definitely like opened up my um, ideas to, to that there's more. It gave me hope. Thank you. Thank you. That was similar, I think, Dr. Bullard, to what you have found also in the anecdotal research, right, of, of experiences of people that have used it. It's connection. And... Yeah. <clears throat> um, a book that I highly yeah. recommend if you're inclined this way, and I have it on audiobook, is called On Not Having a Head by D.E. Hardin. And it was published in 1961. He was a UK person who at age 33 was hiking in the Himalaya. And he said he had this moment when he took in all of the glory of this beautiful landscape. And he realized afterwards, he disappeared. Now, technically that's, many would say the default mode mechanism and that's part of what our brain that helps us understand that we're a separate person, who we are, helps us kind of mull over things, but also can lead us to worrying and thinking a lot about ourselves and worrying about what other people think about us. So he had this great experience of egolessness. And it's something that the Tibetan Buddhists and other Buddhists talk about as well. So there are many ways to get there. But I love the way he talks about it. And when he came home and he explored every religion he could read about and every philosophy and spiritual experience, he said the closest description of what he experienced was from the Zen people. And the rest of the book has some great Zen stories. So it's a, I'm not sure how well known it is, but it's a pretty fun book. Mm. If you want to lose your head. <laughs> That's so interesting. Yeah, it's like, so if you kind of take away this ego function of you know, feeling separate and you can kind of see how then that might um, transfer into le being less anxious. You know, if you feel like you're kind of one with everything, you know, um, it's- And it brings us back to mindfulness and that Mark Twain quote, I'll repeat it. It's worth repeating. Most of the terrible things in my life never actually happened because they were things you're worried about. How many of us have ever worried? I wish I had a dollar for every worry I've had. At 75, I'd be richer than the Amazon guy. We all do that. So egolessness allows you to put things in perspective. What a universe we're in. What an amazing thing to be alive, just to be alive. And um, Eric, I think you had mentioned EMDR uh, in your in the interview that you had worked with, and, and maybe mm -hmm. well, you mentioned it as well. But could you explain a little bit about, about that? To get what is that? Maybe Eric. Um, so the yeah, the EMDR that I had done um, was a, a technique where um, there was a. I, I used a little vibrating, I called them beans, but I put one in my right hand and my left hand, and then the vibrations would pulse from left to right as the therapist walked, um, guided me and, and, and coached me through the trauma, uh, reliving the trauma uh, with hopes of, of it not becoming so traumatic for me. Okay. So that, Eric, was, the, could, that was the EMDR. Yeah. Eric, could I ask you... Um, when you think of trauma, and of course you, you talked about a very difficult childhood, but when you think of trauma, do you also think about the diagnoses, the treatments, all that you went through with your brain to brain cancer treatment? Yeah. Yeah, I think there was physical trauma from the from the treatment. I think there was emotional trauma from from being told that that I have a, a brain tumor. And there's no cure and that 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 uh it's gonna kill me you know essentially and so that's, while that's all a of form that, of trauma right there yes and while all of that was true and it didn't change your brain tumor status or your brain cancer status but you were able to change somehow 
your awareness of that and your ability to be with it and live with it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I feel that, you know, when, when you undergo the, the brain surgery and the radiation and, and then the chemotherapy targeted towards, towards the brain, um, the neural pathways start to shut down and information doesn't travel. So anything that you can do to open up, like by learning a new, learning a new fill in the blank, you know, uh, um, or <clears throat> practicing mindfulness meditation, you can, you, you can find ways to open up those neural pathways and allow information to travel again. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. And there's a follow-up question for you as well. When you talked about um, having more hope, I think this is for you, Eric. Um, was that, were you referring to having more hope for a cure or hope for feeling um, psychically healed? Um, I, want, I, I wanted to not, I, I wanted to have more hope. You know, I, 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 I recognize for so long that when you're given this diagnosis, it's hard to find hope. And I wasn't looking for a cure. I was just looking for um, a way to take away the torments and find a reason to live again. There's so many wonderful things in my life. I just didn't have the ability to see them. Yeah. And so the, the, the psilocybin and some of the other therapies that I've done have helped me to see those things again. Yeah. Thank you. I, I wasn't alive back then, almost, but not in ancient Greece, where they had two temples. They had a temple for the attempt to cure and heal the physical suffering that people had. But at a certain point, when there was a recognition that nothing more could be done physically, they would move to the other temple of healing, and it was healing of the spirit healing of the psyche, coming to peace with yourself, with everything that was happening. And part of that can be a mindfulness type practice of being in the present moment that Eric also was so helpful to you. But I've been involved in palliative care for about 14 years with staff at UCSF and find that it's a, a wonderful part of medicine to be helping people continue to live even after they've given up the idea of very aggressive treatment. Thank you. Um, so uh, Alexis, this might be another question for you. Um, is there any data about interaction with anti-convulsants like Keppra um, and Lamictal? I'm sorry, I'm not pronouncing that right. Oh gosh, yeah. I'm you know, I am not no expert like David. Um, I think we're all kind of learning. I think there might be some research out there, but I am not privy to. Um, I think that's a really great question and something that I know I personally want to learn more about because I know many people in our community are on anti-seizure medications. And we know that psilocybin does have an effect on certain receptors on the brain and how that interplays with some of our antidepressants um, is a really thoughtful and really smart question, which I don't know I have the answer to. Yeah, great. Yeah, a lot of great research questions here. I love it. Yes. Any of you who are graduate students or looking for some research to do or to fund, please, uh, there's so much that needs to be done in this area. Yeah. One of my reasons for getting involved with this is to hopefully spark some, some more um, desire for people to to start researching it because it is really difficult to 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 find where do you get the mushrooms you know being that they're not legal so i wanted to get involved and find a way to just start asking more questions you know, yeah. hopefully to get some more answers great yeah we really appreciate it um and there is another question here for you eric um your large dose experience sounds internally focused. You had iPads on, you had earmuffs. Um, have, have you considered an outwardly focused experience as well, like a walk in the woods? Yeah, I've done, I've done smaller doses with walks in the woods. At the five gram dose, I, I, I don't think that there's any way that I could possibly navigate the walk in the woods safely without having a guide with me. 
<laughs> but but I definitely have experienced, you know, the first snowfall of a season while walking through the Tahoe forest, uh, while the psilocybin starts to kick in and it can be very magical. Absolutely. Great. And let's see, you talked a little bit about uh, psilocybin and its legalization. Could you, um, where, could you repeat a little bit of that, uh, David? Where do we stand right now in terms of its legalization? Well, I think the safest thing as a non-attorney, non-legislator, and not up to date on what happened today is that things are changing and moving forward. And just like the the movement to decriminalize marijuana started with the most vulnerable populations that we have. And partly that was people with needing pain control and people with cancer. And the biggest organization that has had the biggest impact since about 1984, when he set it up is called the MAPS, M-A-P-S, Multidisciplinary mm -hmm. Association of Psychedelic Studies. And Rick Doblin, who founded that, is still incredibly involved in funding research. Almost all the research has been privately funded. That's, that's changing now because of the changing legal status. And it's ha happening. Cities are doing it. I said Rick Doblin had a wonderful interview on Joe Rogan recently talking about his, his map program. Entertaining too. Entertaining, very sure. entertaining. So there's state law, cities are doing it. It looks like it's going in the direction of marijuana being uh, legal and available. It'll take some time. The other we haven't talked about is MDMA, which is not technically a psychedelic. It's an entheogen and it doesn't bring quite the psychedelic hallucinatory visual effects, but it does, it's called a heart opening medication. And that is seriously being studied for PTSD here at UCSF and around the country and MAPS is doing them. And again, if you're, if you're really interested, you could email me because I have the contacts around the country who are doing these studies and you might be able to get into a study Right. Okay, and we'll share your email maybe in the in the chat or in the follow up email that we send out. Okay. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, and here's a question from Kevin: Does does psilocybin have any effects on cognition, especially any long term effects, um, or any any other lasting side effects that should be considered, like cost benefits? So. Any thoughts about that? I mean, I know Eric, you spoke about like clarity, like you had more clarity, um, but has there any, been any kind of long-term studies of like, you know, cognition and effects? I don't know of any, I can just speak from my own experience and I, I think it's helped me. Um, when you're in a depressive state, it's, it's the, your cognitive function is very, very challenged, low at those states. Um, so. Yeah, you said that you felt. I, I, I'd, in, I'd encourage that person who asked the question to read the 2016 Journal of Psychopharmacology article by the Johns Hopkins, NYU, and UCLA people. They did so many tests. Uh, it's an amazing feat of research. And then the five year follow up. And so the benefits, when you say cognition, what they say is that the experience of deep oneness, for example, or timelessness, time doesn't matter, or I'm more, I feel like I died during the psilocybin and was reborn and death doesn't matter to me. Those, you could call them beliefs that later when they were, people were off the drug, of course, they felt they had glimpsed a deeper reality than the one we walk around in all day long. And it stayed with them as a belief system that was comforting. The woman who was on 60 Minutes, who had been a subject in the Johns Hopkins research, really typified that kind of amazing way of being able to comfort and soothe herself by the insights that she got during the session. 
As far as negative cognition, uh, the Nixon administration tried mightily to talk about the negatives. And uh, there are a lot of people who think it was more of a culture war sort of thing at the time. They were worried because of the Vietnam War and protests and all that. But I think we'd have, it's pretty clear that there are no long-term cognitive deficits that come about from the use of psychedelics, especially in these controlled ways that they're happening. Thank you. And there are a couple of questions. I think people's wheels are turning about, I would love to start doing some research. How would I even start? <laughs> How could I start that process? Um, you know, I, I don't know if you have thoughts about that, um, David, with some of the, the connections of, of, of places that are doing research already. Yes, I do. Contact Naomi <laughs> and Mary at the Brain Cancer Center and Alexa. Um, and let them know of your interest in what capacity you could. It's, uh, we're sitting here in San Francisco with UCS of one of the, if not the largest recipient of federal grant money. There ought to be a way to get some money allocated to this vital, vital question. Okay, yeah, maybe we could talk about that in the after the show as well. Uh, there might be some others who have some ideas around that and put our, put our heads together. <laughs> Um, all right, and then just a couple of other questions. We, we're only kind of at the last minute here. Uh, this is around um, kind of how it how you take it. So I think, Eric, maybe you talked about like you took the whole mushroom. Is it also available in other forms like powders and things like that? And if so, does that affect the um, potency of it? Do you know? Is so I don't, I don't know how it affects the potency of it, but I have ingested the actual mushroom itself. I've also taken it in a form of chocolate where it's been uh, put into a chocolate bar. I've also taken it as a tincture. Okay. Given new meaning to the Snickers. <laughs> Snickers. <chocolate> bar. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All oh, right. and I've also taken it. I've also taken it in a capsule. Okay. Right. Okay. And it's also available as a liquid. However, these are, um, yeah, there's a big difference between what's available out there on the underground market versus what is in research where it's very well regulated. And underground market, it's hard to have a, a, a proper dose because it's just not measured. It's not tested. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We haven't mentioned this and I, I can't give you the data, but it's pretty well established that it's not addictive it's a powerful experience when you do the dose that they did in the studies. It's powerful. You don't wake up the next day and say, oh, I think I'd like to do that again. You need time to recover. It's just not open to addictive uh, abuse in that way. Okay. Okay, well, thank you so much. We're, we're out of time right now, but um, Dr. Bullard, Eric, um, Alexa, I'm so appreciative of your time and sharing what you know. Um, I know there's still so many questions and I really appreciate you answering the best you, you can um, and just sharing your experiences, Eric, as well. Um, and we will kind of put a pin in this and, and, and try to come back when, when there has been some more research and we have more to share with you. We'll definitely keep following. But, but, but one thing we could do right now, all of us, you take a moment, breathe in, and imagine you've just had a four-hour psilocybin experience, and you're feeling connected to the universe. You're feeling the love of people in your life. You were walking outside in a little while and see trees and blue sky and realize what an amazing planet we live on in an amazing universe, and uh, see if that helps. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, we hope to see you again in a future webinar. And for those of you who would like to stay after the show, we will be on here. Um, we ask that you